We are back, Math 241, uh, Lecture 55, if I remember right, from what I saw out there. Good, I remember that. Um, we have started Section 8 of Chapter 8. Uh, we probably ought to do a little bit more. We're not going to finish it. Uh, we'll kind of clarify by the end of class today what, from this section, you'll be responsible for on tomorrow's test. We need to talk about content of the test today as well. Um, but there was a, Nicole, what was that problem that you sent me an email about? Um, there's two of them, but... No, just one. Sorry. No, go ahead. <laughs> um, <laughs> you should know me by now. This is the second semester you've had me. Sorry. The first one's X to the N over... Okay, go ahead. X to the N. Over N times... 8 to the n. Yeah. And so, it wants you to find the radius and the interval convergence. So the summation from? Oh, any? it starts at 1. 1? Mm -hmm. All the way to infinity? Mm -hmm. Okay. So we want the <laughs> interval of convergence. Uh, give me a hint to where is this from so we, when we hit that section in review, we'll just hit it a little bit. I think it's 8.5. Okay. It is. It's okay. Not too. All right. So in 8.5, that was when they first started talking about power series, and you were, I think, kind of first using the ratio test, right, <coughs> to determine the interval of convergence. Now, if this is uh, when we're done, we should have an interval of convergence that is centered where? At zero. At zero because we don't have an x minus 1 or x plus 2. We just have x, so it should be centered at zero. And then we're going to go out 2 or 3 or 8 or 1 eighth of a unit. I don't, it's, I don't know from here. So one of the things we were going to review today is the ratio test, so this will suffice. Um, we want to take a <coughs> limit, and this will be a test item tomorrow, is using the ratio test, um, determining the interval on which it converges. Um, maybe it possibly converges for all values of x. Maybe it converges only for a single value of x, but those are the three choices. So in the numerator, we ought to put the n plus first term. Denominator, the nth term. Get everything on the same line, get rid of a complex fraction. All right, what kind of falls out and what's left? About 8 to the n over 8 to the n plus 1. What is where? Eight, there's an extra 8 on the bottom, so... And that is, we can bring that out in front if we need to. Uh, how about x to the n plus 1 in the top and x to the n in the bottom. X in the top. And what happens to n over n plus 1 as n approaches infinity? That approaches 1. All right, so I think we've already done everything we need to as far as taking a limit as n approaches infinity, so we're done with that part, actually. And what do we have? 
absolute value of x over 8. Is that all that's left? <coughs> and when we've evaluated everything, we could take that 8 out in front. It's not that big a deal. But whatever we get for this, <coughs> in order for this to converge, so under what conditions, when we use the ratio test every time, will this result converge? When this is less than 1. So algebraically, we can take care of that in that fashion. Does that work? Mm -hmm. Multiply through by 8. So there is our interval of convergence so far. Uh, it is centered at x equals 0. The uh, radius of convergence will be 8. Do we need to do anything else? OK, we do need to check the endpoints. It's not going to change the fact that it's centered at 0. It's not going to change the fact that the radius of convergence is 8. But it might change the interval in a sense that we want to include one or both of these endpoints. So let's see what happens at x equals negative 8. Now that we didn't address the fact that that started at 1. Why did it need to start at 1? Right, we would add a 0 in the denominator. So that would have been a problem. So starting it at 1 was necessary. Uh, what can be done with this? Because this is going to be you tomorrow about this time. OK. You have a negative one. OK, split that up, right? So negative 1 on top. And then also an 8 to the n. And the 8 to the n's knockout. Is that what I was hearing also? Uh, what are we left with? What do you think that is? It's the alternating, it's the alternating harmonic, and we've already dealt with that. The harmonic itself is divergent, but the alternating harmonic is convergent. Do we need to justify that on the test? Uh, I, I think if it's in this category, that's a good question. And I was going to address that, but it's good that you asked that. I think probably other people were ready to ask the same question. Because we've dealt with this particular series probably four or five times as we've gone through this chapter, I think you can just say it's an alternating harmonic. But any other alternating series, we should probably go through the two-part test, right? And we'll review that in a few minutes. Oh. But uh, I think it's OK to say this is alternating harmonic. Therefore, it is convergent. So we do want to include that particular endpoint. At x equals 8. So we get a to the n over itself, which to me looks like just the harmonic. Therefore, it's divergent. So our final interval of convergence, we do want to include <coughs> negative 8. We do not want to include 8. Uh, all the other stuff we gave is the same, centered at 0. Uh, radius of convergence is 8. Is that all right with that one? And you said there was another one? Number, <coughs> number 4 on the web design. And it's negative 2 to the n over the square root of n. Negative 2, the whole thing to the n? Yeah. Over the square root of n times x plus 3 to the n. And then it starts at 1.
goes to infinity. Yeah. So if we get, an, and this is from the same section? Yeah. Okay, so this should be another ratio test. Uh, any guesses? Centered at negative yeah. three. Okay, centered at negative three, right? The A value is negative three. Anything else? Okay, well, let's see. It's not that. Right. Right. We okay? Ratio test again? I mean, I like that's all it is. Let's just set it up and see what we think happens. Negative two. Um, do we want to do anything with that before? Well, let's just negative two to the n plus one. And we're going to divide that by the nth term. Let's go ahead and multiply by its reciprocal. So we've got another x plus 3 in the numerator. Let's go ahead and take, we'll do everything all in one step here. We've got another x plus 3. So that takes care of those two. How about these two as n approaches infinity? One. And we've got an extra negative two, only it's not going to be negative because we're in absolute value, so an extra two in the numerator. And a one in the denominator. So we decided centered at negative three. What do you think is going to happen? Divide by two, right? Like last problem, we multiplied by eight to take care of the eight in the denominator. And then what? Subtract three. And then you could check the endpoints. Does that work? Everybody okay with that? We're jumping off place. All right, let's um, spend a few minutes on the binomial series, and then we'll kind of stop it short of finishing that section. We had a lot leading up to this yesterday, but this is the place where we were able to end. We decided that 1 plus x to the k using the Taylor or, in fact, McLaurin series because it was centered at 0. We decided this was an expanded form 1 plus k times x, k and k minus 1 x squared x cubed and so on. So it doesn't seem like a big leap when k is a nice positive integer, but when this becomes helpful is when k is not a nice positive integer. So the closed version of that, and we probably ought to spend a minute or two that. So we start this coefficient out in front of the x to the n, and which eventually gets divided by n factorial. We started at k, and then we kind of take integers that are not necessarily integers, numbers that are different from it, backing up one at a time. So k, and then k minus 1, and k minus 2. We decided to stop this at 2 even though the power and the factorial were both 3. So that was k minus n plus 1, right, is where we stopped that. 
this is kind of awkward and we didn't address this yesterday because we got this right at the end of class and it's time to go. But when n is 0, x to the n, that's x to the 0, that's not strange. We see that a lot. 0 factorial kind of is strange, but by definition, that's 1. But this thing kind of becomes strange. We know what the first term is. It's 1. Uh, and I've seen this strange situation kind of alleviated a little bit. So far, it's x to the 0 over 0 factorial, which is 1. But when we say k times k minus 1, and we're going to stop this at k minus n plus 1, well, what is n? n is 0, so k minus 0 plus 1. Well, we're starting it at k, and we're trying to end it at a number that's 1 larger than k. That doesn't look right. The first term is 1. Okay? In other words, none of these terms are actually present. Not that it's 0, but they're not here yet. They don't really start to become part of the problem till we get to the second term and third term and so on. So when n equals 1, it's pretty clear. Well, let's just try that one. When n is 1, you got k. Let me, let me back up. Here's where we start. We start at k. And where do we end? k minus 1 plus 1. What is that? That's k. k minus 1 plus 1 would be k. So we start at k and we end at k. In fact, that's the only one on n equals 1. So as strange as that is, at least it actually, there's something there from this. I've seen this written before because that's a little odd, actually kind of a little awkward. I've seen it kind of the, with the first term farmed out. It is 1. It is 1 here, but it's just odd to, to do that. 1 is the first term, and then it's actually start this process where you start at k when n is 1, it's k minus 1 plus 1, so it ends at k, starts at k and ends at k, k is the only thing you write down, and then the rest of them kind of fall in line pretty nicely. When n is 2, k minus 2 plus 1 is k minus 1, starts at k, ends at k minus 1, which is exactly what happens. So either way it works, but uh, this might be a little kinder to the eyes, I guess. It just, it's just odd. When n is 0, this k stuff is odd. Strange, not odd. All right, well, let's say we had, let's start very simply here. Let's say we wanted to write, and I'm not going to mess with integer powers, positive integer powers, because we had an example of that yesterday, and the question was, well, that seemed kind of stupid to do that, and we all agreed that it was not really a whole lot gained when it's a nice positive integer. But when it's not, in this case, k is equal to 1 half. Is this original or this rewritten form, is this a polynomial? It is clearly not a polynomial. The square root is not a polynomial. In order to be a polynomial, it has to be powers of x or x minus a to a non-negative integer. This is non-negative, but it's not an integer. So clearly this is not a polynomial. Can we write it in some series that kind of resembles a polynomial? That's what this is all about. So 1 plus x to the k, and k is equal to 1 half. When we expand that, what do we get? What's the first term? 1. In general, what's the next term? It, k times x. So let's keep track down here. So our first term is 1, and for this particular series, k is a half, so what, a half x? There's the next term, k, which is 1 half. 
times one half minus one, which is negative a half. And let's just continue down here instead of continuing up here and then rewriting it. Now that we've got the pattern going, what's the next term? Maybe we don't have the pattern going. Or it's so easy you don't want to respond. Does that work? So the fact that we've got one negative here means that this whole term is going to be negative. Now we're two negatives, right? This term's back to positive. So it looks like it's going to alternate, right? After we get past this one anyway. So what's the end result? How many x squared do we have for this thing that clearly resembles a polynomial to describe this thing which is clearly not a polynomial? What do we have here? Negative one eighth. Is that right? And here we've got two negatives, which is a positive. It looks like we've got three eighths divided by six, three over forty eight, which would be what? One sixteenth. The next term should be negative, right? Because there'll be three negatives here. So we have this power series from this 1 plus x to the 1 half or 1 plus <coughs> s x to the k. So very polynomial looking. Those are always easier to deal with than things that are not polynomials. Um, questions about that before we go to another example? We'll just do one more. Now, I'm, these two are pretty simple. I'm keeping it 1 plus x exactly like what we developed. If it's not 1 plus x, we might have to do a little bit of work to get it in the form of 1 plus something. Sorry, it's not what I want. So 1 plus x to the negative 2. So our k value here is negative 2. Clearly, again, this is not a polynomial, something to a negative power. It's got to be a non-negative integer to be a polynomial. It is negative, so it falls apart there. Not a polynomial. But let's write it as a polynomial type expression what would the next term be? In general, what is it? Okay. Kx. So in this case, it's next term, next coefficient for x squared, <coughs> negative 2, 1 less than that, negative 3, that many x squared, negative 2, negative 3, negative 4, x cubed, and so on. So what does it look like? Negative 2x for the second term should be back to positive. 6 over 2, 3x squared, is that right? And what do we have here? Negative 4, is that right? I don't know, it kind of looks like we have a little pattern going there. If you would predict the next term, what would you predict it to be? 5x to the 4th? I think we could probably verify that too. 
This, I mean, we are reviewing today. This fits in with something we've had earlier that is potentially a test item tomorrow. We use the binomial approach to this, the 1 plus x to the k expansion. What's another way of getting 1 plus x to the negative second? And you might want to think about it in terms of that. How is that? How is that related? That's the translation of that, by the way. To that. It's the whole thing squared. Okay, let's go to another answer because that's not going to help us. It's the derivative, isn't it? If you took the derivative of this, is it equal to this? Yes. So, do we know something about that? And then we'll take its derivative and see if it matches up with what we just did according to the binomial expansion. Isn't this really 1 over 1 minus negative x, which is the a over 1 minus r format? So the first term, is that starting to ring a bell now a little bit, if it didn't earlier? So if we were to expand this thing, what would it look like? The first term would be 1. That's the first term. This is the ratio, so the next term must be negative x. I think we have a little correction that we have to make, right? Not exactly what we want, but I think we can justify that in terms of an extra term that's there in the derivative. We would multiply this by negative x and get x squared. Multiply that by negative x and get that, that by negative x, and so on. That's 1 over 1 plus x. Well, what's the derivative of 1 over 1 plus x? It's the derivative of 1 plus x to the negative first, which is, there's that extra baggage, right? Negative 1 times 1 plus x to the negative second which is negative 1 over 1 plus x squared. Now, that's not what we really wanted, was it? We wanted positive 1 up there. So what we're going to generate by taking the derivative of this is actually the negative of what we generated over here. So the derivative of this, which is negative 1. Sorry, that's not what I want. The derivative of 1 over 1 plus x, which is negative 1, is the negative of what we wanted. So let's take the derivative, and we know we need to negate everything to make it equal to what we just found by the binomial expansion. So what's the derivative of 1? 0. What's the derivative of negative x? Negative 1. What's the derivative of x squared? What's the derivative of negative x cubed? and the derivative of x to the fourth. And if we negate every one of those terms, aren't we right back to here? 
right? I think we got this a quicker and easier way, personally. I mean, we just we didn't have to find something and then take its derivative and then negate all the terms. We went right to our final answer. But if you'll compare those two, negative 1 times the 1, there it is, negative 1 times 2x, negative 1 times that one, there it is. So it is the same function, therefore the power series should be the same however we derive it. Okay, that'll suffice with 8.8. .8. We're, we're close to being done, but not quite done. So let's talk about the test, which um, I don't know, probably anything that is just 1 plus x. So as long as we don't have to mess with that and convert it so that it's in that form, an example would be, uh, let's suppose that we didn't have x there. Let's suppose we had a minus x over 3, and we had that to the 1 4. This is off limits for the test because we really haven't done that yet. Now, could we put it in the form of 1 plus something to the k? Yes, you can. It's 1 plus negative x over 3 to the 1 fourth. So in that expansion, Everywhere you see a k, you would put in a one fourth, and everywhere this sounds odd, but everywhere you see an x, you would replace the x with what is occupying that position that x normally occupies. So x gets replaced with negative x over three, k gets replaced with one fourth. That we're probably not there yet. Okay, we we're almost there, but not quite there. But Anything 1 plus x to the half, to the two-thirds, to the four-fifths, to the negative third, those I think would be fair game for this test because we have covered a couple like that. So that could be a variety of things, but this will be exactly 1 plus x. That's kind of where we are in section 8.8. .8. All right, well, let's back up to 8.4, which is the first topic. If you look at our course syllabus, it shows that, I guess, technically 8.3 would be the first item for this test, but we were ahead at that point in time, and 8.3 was actually on the last test. So start, this test starts at 8.4. That's alternating series. Uh, we have an alternating series test. How's that go? Two parts. You have this, you're handed this alternating series. First of all, how do you recognize that it's alternating? Okay, negative 1 to the n or negative 1 to the n plus 1 or something like that. You see that in the argument to the right of the sigma notation. All right, so we know it's an alternating series. By the way, if you see a negative 1 to the 2n, that's not alternating. What's negative 1 to the 2n? It's always 1, right? So that's not that I'm going to trick you like that, but don't allow yourself to be tricked by that. It's not alternating because that's always even. But if we know it's alternating, What's the first thing we check? Okay, we want the terms to be ultimately decreasing, right? So the value in magnitude, so we don't care about the alternating part, the n plus first term is smaller than its predecessor. So if it helps to do that, uh, throw out the alternating part, just the 
A sub n or B sub n, whatever the rest of the argument is. We want them to be ultimately decreasing. That's going to help the cause if it's going to um, converge. And what's the other piece? Right. The nth term description, way out there to the right, goes to zero. So if they don't, in magnitude, get smaller and smaller and smaller, and eventually approach zero, then it doesn't have a chance. But that's a little less restrictive when you think about it than a series that's not alternating. If it's not alternating, this is not good enough to determine convergence. Nicole? You take the limit of the a n plus 1 term, not just the a n term? For the um, Yes, actually, a sub, it doesn't matter, but I think you're probably correct. I got a little. Either one would work because you're working your way out to the right, but it's the nth term description. Thank you. Don't need to make it any more difficult than it is. Uh, if we stop the alternating series at n equals 5, how could we determine an upper bound for the error associated with that truncated alternating series? We'd go to the sixth term. So you're never any further away from the actual sum than the value of the so-called next term. So if you stop at n, you want to take a look at the n plus first term. So the error You want to look at the magnitude. We don't care if it's positive or negative. The magnitude of the first term that was not included in this series. And again, that's not the error. That's the upper bound. So it's more than the error. So it's kind of the error at its worst. Um, also in section four, absolute convergence was dealt with. I don't know, let's just, since we're reviewing, let's just kind of hit the quick and easy ones and We're considering whether or not this particular series, and it is an alternating series, is it absolutely convergent? So we're really not only considering this, we're also considering what? It's non-alternating non counterpart. So if the question is, is this series that we're handed, the alternating series, is this absolutely convergent? It is not absolutely convergent because the alternating version converges. It's an alternating harmonic, but the non-alternating ver version diverges. So they would both need to converge for it to be absolutely convergent. So if the alternating and the non-alternating both converge, then it's absolutely convergent. What can I do to make this change the problem? How about if I did that? Now it's absolutely convergent, right? This would be a, I don't know, P series, Q series, L, M series, one of those. P series, what we called it. And P is what? Greater than one. Therefore, it converges. Uh, any test that I kind of specifically held you responsible for, integral test, um, Comparison, limit comparison, I'm not specifically going to ask any of those. Now, if they come in handy on a problem and you think it's useful in a problem, you're certainly welcome to use them because we've covered them, but I'm not going to specifically throw in an integral test on this one. Because we're going to have to somehow prove that the non alternating one doesn't Right. So it would have to be something we've had that's a pretty easy case to battle through, like this one. 
P series, P, lar P equals 2, P larger than 1. So this converges. We could actually do the alternating series test on this. So this series is absolutely convergent. But I'm not specifically going to say use the integral test to validate convergence. Might be kind of in the background of, a, of another problem. Also in 8.4 was our first look at the ratio test. Uh, we've done a lot of those through the course of this chapter. We've done a couple of them today. Um, I'm not going to do a specific example problem right now of the ratio test. And in fact, as we go into 8.5 on power series, and we're still doing power series, with Taylor and McLaurin and the binomial, it's all kind of power series, but we're getting there in different ways. Power series, we also use the ratio test. In fact, those two problems that Nicole brought in today at the start of class are problems from this section. Uh, we use that to determine the interval of convergence and the radius of convergence. And remember that when you do that, you have to check the endpoints kind of separately. So we do get a generic interval sometimes, and we do need to check the endpoints uh, because we don't know what happens when the limit of the ratio test is 1. The test fails there, so we have to check it separately. If the L is less than 1, we know that means convergence. If the limit is greater than 1, we know that means divergence. When L is 1, the so-called ratio test fails, so we have to do that by hand. So that's why we check the endpoints separately. Uh, 8.6 was still more with power series, but it's functions as power series. I would recommend uh, kind of everybody coming into the testing situation with a with a toolbox, not a, a literal toolbox, okay, but a toolbox of functions that you know and you know what they look like. Here's one of the tools in your toolbox because we might need to use this to help us solve another problem. We don't want to have to kind of redefine the wheel here. All right, so what is 1 over 1 minus x? That's the a over 1 minus r format. So the first term would be 1 plus x plus x squared plus x cubed, right? That's helpful to know. If we see something else in that form, we can kind of equate what's the first term, what's the ratio, kind of fill it in here. Uh, another function that we developed through the course of this chapter that I think will be helpful to know is e to the x. And then if we have e to the 2x or e to the negative 5x, we don't do what Daniel did last night and kind of reestablish all these ugly first and second and third and fourth derivatives. We just plug it into this one or the sine or the cosine. What is e to the x? What's it look like? Might just be helpful to get it in this form rather than the expanded form. Now, haven't we used that? Didn't we use that in a couple of web assigned questions also? And that was helpful that we didn't really have x to the n. We had something else to the n over n factorial. Instead of being e to the x, it was e to the whatever that number was. One of them was three-fifths. The other one was, what, negative natural log of two, I think. Look back at those homework problems. But that, this, your knowledge of this becomes handy in those as well. Now, we didn't get this until um, the sine and the cosine. We didn't get these until we got to Taylor series and McLaurin series. But they are power series. We're talking about the ones that you should know coming into the test. 
sine of x is odd. How's that go? Odd powers, odd factorials, alternating. I don't know if it's all that helpful necessarily to know the closed form. I mean, you could get there. If you can come up with this, you can get x to the 2n plus 1. That's a guaranteed odd number, right? If you double something and add one, it's guaranteed to be odd. And what? Alternating? That's not that big of a deal. I think you could come up with that in a few seconds. But knowing this is how the sine of x progresses in terms of powers of x, that's helpful. Now, let's suppose you remember the sine, but you draw a blank on the cosine. Okay? How can you use the sine to come up with the power series for cosine? Take the derivative. Derivative of x is 1. Derivative of this is 1 over 3 factorial times 3x squared. Once you get it going, you'll probably resurrect it anyway. So the 3's reduced, so that's what? x squared over 2 factorial. Now we're rolling. What's the next term? And this is an even function, so it kind of makes sense that you're going to have 2's and 2 factorials and 4's and 4 factorials and so on. But those are going to be handy for you to know. Uh, possibly the inverse tangent. I think the inverse tangent is fairly easy to come up with if you don't remember what it is because the inverse tangent is the integral of 1 over 1 plus x squared, right? And I feel confident that in a matter of a few seconds, you could all write a power series for that. First term is what? 1. The ratio is what? Negative, Negative x squared. So you could come up with a power series for that and integrate it, but it might also be to your advantage to have that one committed to memory as well. So what is the thing that we're going to integrate? First term is 1. Is that working for everybody? So when we integrate 1, we get x. When we integrate negative x squared, we get integrate other way, x to the 3 over 3. Not 3 factorial, just 3, plus, and now we've got the pattern going, right? So if you want to remember that one and kind of use that in our little library of functions that we have going, our little toolbox, then that may be helpful in doing another problem. I think you can come up with that one pretty quickly. So, Daniel, um, the problem that you were confronted with, and he did the long way, let's make sure that we don't do that battle on the test because time is a little more precious on a test than it is doing a problem outside of class. What was the? Sine of x to the fourth. Not the whole thing to the fourth, just that, just, right? Yeah, just OK. So what is that written out as a power series? Well, he did the first and second and third and fourth derivatives, which I wouldn't advise that because we have already done this battle for the sine of something. The sine of something is that something minus what? That something cubed over 3 factorial? So instead of having sine of x, we have sine of x to the fourth. So everywhere there's an x in here, there should now be a what? x to the fourth up here. So what's it look like? x to the fourth 
minus x to the fourth cubed over three factorial, x to the fourth to the fifth over five factorial, and so on. So don't blaze that trail again if the trail has already been blazed. Yes? So is the inverse tangent the same thing as sine except without the factorial on the bottom? Same numbers, just it's not. There's not a factorial. Uh, they alternate, right? Yeah. yeah. So it is the same thing, except without the factorials. That's right. Pretty similar. Yeah. Okay. And hopefully that's not going to be a point of confusion. Uh, if it is, then just derive it. It doesn't take but 35 seconds to do it anyway. Um, power series can be differentiated and integrated. We've done that either in expanded form or the closed form. Same derivative and integral rules. Uh, McLaurin and Taylor series, we've hit those pretty hard all along. T4, if you see a capital T sub 4 of x, we want the fourth Taylor polynomial. And how do you find the fourth Taylor polynomial? Does it have four terms? Is that where we stop? you stop at n equals 4. So n equals 0, n equals 1, n equals 2, n equals 3, and n equals 4. It could potentially have five terms. Some of them from time to time drop out. So if every other one is dropping out, t4 could possibly only have three terms, or whichever terms happen to drop out. Um, That ought to do it. I think everything else we've dealt with. That was Pardon? That was 8.7? 8.7? That was what you just talked about? Well, we've hit all the kind of the common Taylor polynomials, McLaurin series. The things that I would hold you responsible for, we've already dealt with yesterday a lot, today some. So we don't really need to review them again. All right, test will be tomorrow.